Good morning. We're so excited to have you all here on your first session of your first day. Um, if you're in the session, it's probably because you're a creator wondering how to create a portfolio that'll catch the eye of a recruiter. And you're in luck because we have a fantastic panel of people who are specifically selected for their expertise. Um, and we'll be able to tell you just that. So now quickly, just before we get started, I'll let our panelists introduce themselves to you so you know who you're talking to, where they're coming from. And then at the end of the session, we'll have a Q&A. So uh, you'll be able to ask them your questions directly. So just starting left to right, if you'd like to go ahead, Justin. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Justin Moman. Um, currently, I'm over at Epic Games. I deal with the art station learning and the Epic online learning, but I've been working in game development for over 20 years as an environment artist, art lead, art director, Mortal Kombat series, Tony Hawk, all that stuff. Um, so yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Tyler Smith. I'm a senior environment artist at Probably Monsters. I've been in the gaming industry for about 10 years now, and I've worked on IPs like Ghost of Tsushima and Ghost of Tsushima Legends. Hi, my name is Kami Leach, and I'm a technical account manager at Epic Games, I'm mostly working with media and entertainment. And my background is about 15 years in visual effects, doing lighting, look development, and supervising. Uh, my name is Galen Davis. I'm a senior evangelist here at Epic Games. Um, I've worked on games like uh, Evolve, Star Wars, Borderlands, Bioshock, and God of War. So yeah, excited to be here with all of you guys today. Please give it up for all our esteemed panelists. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, so to dive in, before we talk about everything that you should be doing, I just thought we should start off maybe with some common things of absolute don'ts, things that right off the bat will turn you off of a portfolio. So Justin, I wanted to start with you since you do a lot of work with the rookies. What are some common mistakes you see that are immediate kind of Bug no, no, no. Yeah. Right. Um, resolution of what you're submitting. I've seen people submit something that looks technically like it would be beautiful, but they submitted it at a really low resolution. They also didn't show the breakdown of what they're doing. So those are two really big ones off the bat. I can keep going. You can keep going, but then if anyone else has um, something that they want to add to it, feel free to jump in. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things I see with a lot of students specifically is they might hold on to pieces in their portfolio for a long period of time. So if it's like a senior project or something, maybe like an item that they made several years ago, I think it's best to kind of uh, sever that, you know, and to say, all right, that was a part of, you know, my past and things that I did but it's not something necessarily to display going forward. And that's really difficult to do as an artist, right? Because you build up attachment to pieces that you make, obviously, but it's it's best sometimes just to set it free, <laughs> so. Yeah, you can't get too attached to the, like, I think that's one of the biggest thing. It makes it hard when you're developing your portfolio, especially when you get to the point where you wanna share it with someone to get a job, hopefully, is the emotional connection you get, but also uh, like this nostalgic thing of like, well, I made this then, but so, yeah, and that actually comes down to the resolution too, because if it's an older piece, maybe you just didn't have the proper render size too at that time. Yeah, one thing I've noticed is grandiose quantity um, versus kind of the intimacy of a space when it comes to an environment piece. So trying to go for like the grand mountain scene or the whole like warehouse or the whole medieval town, um, concentrating more on a smaller slice of what that is and really putting your element of your personal spin, uh, concentrating on storytelling, uh, quality of the pieces. So kind of doing the boiling down of, and that will really rise the quality of the pieces that you have when you do that presentation for the portfolio piece. Yeah, and to uh, add to that, basically, remember you gotta capture your audience in the first 30 seconds, so your portfolio needs to be designed that way. So definitely quality versus quantity and I've definitely seen people hit it two or three times, look at images and say, nope, not gonna do it. So really focus on your strengths and getting yourself presented accurately early. Yeah, so when you are talking about like what they're saying about quality over quantity, we do wanna see your process, but uh, I believe uh, one of you already mentioned, we don't wanna see like an excess image dump because you don't really need to show me 20 images to show how you made that one piece. I just, the wireframe, I want to see your UV space. I want to see the reference is really, really key for me. Like, I want to know, I like to see your creative problem solving. And that tells me how you would fit on the team that you'd be getting hired for and how you would create a problem solve any of the situations that we have within that development. Um, I know, Tyler, you have such a recognizable style that every time I see it on, on ArtStation pop up, I already know it's you just from the thumbnail. Um, how do you create a portfolio that stands out and develop your own like style and, 
um, where people can just pick it off right off the bat? I would say um, really putting your fingerprints all over every part of the process. Um, so everything from uh, sculpting or lying down, what you're doing in even uh, procedural things like substance painter or substance designer, um, really not leaving any part of the process up to kind of an automated um, sort of, you know, button click, if that makes sense. Uh, whether it's covering, you know, your edges of your metallic piece with, you know, uh, wear and tear and scratches or the grit and grime and stuff, you want to really stop and just every single step and just be like, okay, you know, I want to really do this, at least kind of look over it by hand and see, you know, what can I do to sort of put some element of storytelling into it. Does anybody else, uh, maybe another artist on the yeah. panel, have uh, something to add? Like, I'll go before you, maybe. I don't know. Uh, one thing I really like that uh, he's doing with his work is that he has a very defined color palette and the saturation that he used. So I think that these days, whatever your work you're doing, you really need to tailor towards the studio that you're applying for. Don't take something that has an Overwatch style and apply to Naughty Dog and be upset when they don't contact you, no matter how good your work is. So that a lot of the research that you have to do is not just on what the role entails, but the art style that that studio is actually looking for. So that's going to make you pop as well. Another point uh, I wanted to say, this is a little bit different, but um, if you take your asset that you have in your portfolio, and uh, another thing that um, I think is really will get you major brownie points is putting it through different elements of covering it with snow, covering it with sand, um, making it super dirty and scratched, like taking it from a sort of off the factory line sort of pristine and then using the elements in Unreal Engine, like vertex painting to like really ding it up, show that you know how to work within the elements of the engine to show like, hey, this element can, or this uh, asset that I've made can go through all these different factors. It can be covered with snow. If you destroy it, if you like actually like make a destroyed version, that's gonna earn you major brownie points because you know people love to have props that you can destroy in games. So really showing that flexibility of you have your prop or your asset and then showing the flexibility uh, of what you see in a lot of AAA games of like, you know, this is gonna be destroyed version, on fire version, you know, frozen version, like things like that is really cool. Just to go with that, I mean, just what you're saying, the diversity in the thought process of how you can move this through different elements, different mediums, and that's what a lot of things are turning to now is how will this apply to games and to linear content, and what can you do to show that your assets work that well across the board? One more thing, too, is I remember one of the very first studios I worked at, Midway Games, I had this art director that I, I had made like a broom, and I was like, this broom looks amazing, it's great. And he came by, he just tore it apart. I really hated him for it, but you know, you grow old. And he had worked on like Lord of the Rings and Star Wars, so I was like, I should really listen to him. But he asked like, this is no good because like, who held this broom? Where did they hold it? Which way they're like, were they like sweeping? Like add the tape to it, maybe they replace some bristles. So even with the, like the smallest asset, you can identify that there's character to that without saying anything. So, and then if you can show that off with a couple pieces, then I, if someone's hiring and they're looking at your portfolio, they get that you're actually going to take any like asset or like task that's assigned to them and really think about it more than just, oh, I'm just gonna make a, I'll make a broom. They're like, you're gonna think about it. A, a question we hear a lot when it comes to portfolios is how much, especially with games, is how much should I be targeting my portfolio to work on this specific game? Should it look like this studio style or should I develop my own style? Um, Galen, do you wanna maybe? Yeah, no, I'd say that's that's the ball game for sure. I think that you definitely want to cater your work to the to the studio that you're looking to apply for. Um, I mean, Justin covered it sort of on the last question, yeah. But I mean, if your style is so divergent from the studio that you're applying for, they probably will you know move on to the next one pretty fast. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think like the other thing too is it's not necessarily even just covering like the style of the work. Um, it's also like looking at like maybe the problems that that studio is looking to solve maybe on a future project, right? Or things that you've identified like from a previous game that they're maybe making a sequel to of like, oh, this didn't really work out for whatever reason, maybe texturing quality or geometric detail or what have you, right? If you show that you can actually solve problems that maybe they were struggling with on a previous title, that's a huge leg up, so I, yeah. Yeah, there's, I've been a part of studios actually where, to what Galen is saying, um, where I've seen people who are just fans of the game go online grab concept art and recreate it and then solve, like if the concept art's only showing you one part, they built out the whole space and they solved it and they weren't afraid to actually address <clears throat> the subject matter of what was being done with that game. And we didn't have an open position, we hired them. 
you know, because we just this person is that motivated to go out there, solve those problems, like submit it to us, like we'll find a position for you. Yeah, I guess in terms of seizing opportunities, Cami, you're somebody who's worked across so many different areas in production. I'm wondering, where do you think right now there are the most opportunities for people who are starting out and how can they craft their portfolios to seize those opportunities? Yeah, I mean, I've had a chance to work in visual effects, augmented reality, and then now over here at Epic. And I think the biggest thing that I found is actually learning how to collaborate with others and actually building a group portfolio and a group effort. Having the humility, humility to just be like, I only did this part, but we came together. The story came together as a group because that's what it inevitably all of our jobs end up being and how you end up moving from the next job to the next job is people want to work with you. Eventually, your portfolio just becomes all the great work you've done and you don't have to actually even show it you have this friend who works somewhere and they really enjoy being with you. So making that effort to be collaborative, be that person, you know, I've had CD supervisors go grab me a coffee while I'm doing like a lighting presentation. Same thing, we all share a role in this. And so doing that will make you, it'll last a lot longer, I think. She, she, brought, she brought up a good point too. Um, it doesn't just have to also be the art. There was a, a, a student I used to have like just recently last year and she always had like a little bit of a sense of humor, but she would showcase her work on our station, and she, you can tell by the way she was describing things, her enthusiasm and then her little sense of humor, but she also presented herself really, really well in terms of her work, and everything was cohesive. So her subject matter was kind of uh, across the board the same, her art style, her presentation style, and you can see that she was enthusiastic, and that really drive, gives you a chance to drive your personality because like uh, they were mentioning, like you are gonna be on a team, you do wanna be able to work with someone and there are ways to interject your, like inject your personality without flat out saying, I'm funny, you know what I mean? Yeah, I would, I would underline like everything that Kami said too, where it's like, you know, when you actually go and work at a studio, cross-disciplinary communication is huge, right? So if you're able to get a project under your belt, like even in college or, you know, with your friends, right, of making something that's collaborative, and like you go through the paces of you know having a source control set up for your project and like working with engineers or what have you, that's huge, right? Because that sets you apart so much compared to maybe just someone who's only created you know beautiful pictures, right? They could be amazing, right? But learning those extra skills are huge when you actually go into a studio environment. So yeah, Galen, you're both an artist and producer on some of the most incredible UE5 work the industry has ever seen. So my question for you is. For people who want to level up their skills and really reach that level of quality, where do you recommend they start? And what's that thing that brings it to you know, the next level? Oh, man. I mean, the amount of resources that are available now compared to when I started are just insane. Um, you know, like when I was kind of like cutting my teeth in the industry, like I was working very much in the poly count space. Uh, that was like where I really kind of started. That was the community where, I mean, I, as far as like my resume and stuff, I'd credit Poly count more than I credit the school that I went to. So, um, so no, I mean, I think that like finding a community and people who are willing to be honest with you, I think that's that's huge, right? Like, I think that um, you know, I still have you know really really fond memories of you know like people who helped me in poly count, right? That they were able to like literally download my projects and like send me like notes based on that. I mean, that's insane, right? Like, I had industry professionals that were doing that. So, I think that there are spaces for that now, right? Obviously, ArtStation is an incredible place to, to do that, right? It's an incredible community. And, like, the thing, I mean, obviously, YouTube videos, there's so much that we put out, you know, here at Epic, you know, as far as uh, training materials, and we're looking to do even more of that, obviously. Um, but, like, I mean, just as, like, an aside, like, with ArtStation and, like, actually proactively seeking help, I, I don't know if, if you, maybe you guys have seen this on ArtStation, but, like, I would post, like, in my thumbnail if I was in this position, I would post, like, critiques wanted or something like that, like, something, like, literally that's, like, please like come and like critique my work. Cause like a lot of people like they'll put tags of like, oh, I worked on you know this game or this movie or what have you. And like that catches people's eyes. But I think you do the same of like looking for critiques would love help, right? Like I don't see any problem with that. So I would, I would proactively seek out the community in that regard. Yeah, the only thing I would say too on top of that would just be specific with the critiques. Um, like give them a little direction of like the information you're looking for. Like, hey, I just got done doing foliage for the first time. I was curious of what people thought about the vines or if you had a different like method of doing it attached is my breakdown. You know what I mean? But yeah, to, to work, because you're gonna, that's the industry. Whatever it's, if it's games, visual effects, virtual production, you're working with someone else. That's why I think the quality of your presentation, but also showcasing your thought process is always huge for us is like when we're looking to hire someone because you can't just 
It's like a math test. You can't just give them the answer and be like, well, I figured it out. Like, you can't just show us something that's done and then expect us to believe that you, like, it's not that we don't believe you. It's like we want to see the process. Because the other thing that happens sometimes is that, and, and uh, it's not like it's happening more, but you'll see people who are really good at following tutorials. But it doesn't mean that they can actually do something on their own. Or they put a piece out, and you're like, that's amazing. How long did it take you? Six months. Ooh, you need it. You get that done in two weeks with us. So it's being aware of that process as well, like how long is this going? But you only get better by what Galen was saying, uh, like working out with the, like the actual community, like Polycount. I used to always go on Polycount too and just look at people's process and ask questions. That's how you get better. Yeah, I'm not sure if anyone has ever seen the challenges on ArtStation, but that's a really great place, especially if you're starting out to build a portfolio piece and get feedback from hosts and the community. Um, Tyler, I know you wanted to say something as well. Oh yeah, I was saying um, just, yeah, it is a very vulnerable to put up. It's like, hey, having my piece critiqued and kind of finding the art of like what specifically about it because it can be very daunting uh, both to the person presenting and the person viewing of like, okay, like, can you critique my piece? Um, and getting some direction that can start a roadmap of like, well, I, I really, the poster can be like, personally, I really like the color or I really like, you know, the work that I did with the topology of like the vines going around the tree or something like that. So that's kind of like, that sets an anchor where, you know, it's like either the person can um, be like, okay, we can go off of that. Um, there are some elements there or you can cross that off where it's like, okay, like you feel good about the color, you feel good about the composition. Um, let's focus now on, you know, the factor that this material uh, needs a little bit more work to be more convincing or just uh, kind of uh, getting that sort of first stake in the ground of like what the critique is gonna be when you do a post rather than just like, hey, you put up the piece and it's like, hey, any feedback is appreciated. Because it's kind of like this sort of, it can be a little bit intimidating for everybody. Well, and to that, I think, you know, starting early and doing that will translate into an actual studio job because that is exactly what's going to happen. You have to show your work in progress. You're going to get feedback. And this will help you build up that confidence to be able to do that while you're working. Do this with a community, a community that you know is going to take care of you because in a studio, they might not. In a studio, one, they don't want you working an extra three weeks on something when it's in the completely wrong direction. Ask for feedback, look for direction, and then learn to read and take it, not personally. I think that's a good point you're doing um, when you say learn to take direction, because just because you're asking for critique doesn't mean that you, they'll, they may, you might like your critique that you're getting, but also if you're asking for a critique and someone gives it to you, you should, you know, respond to them, like thank them for that, and then like dig in deeper. That's how you build those relationships. Yeah, I mean, with that, you know, you want valuable critiques, so when you critique others, make sure yours has some substance to it. That'll make a difference for them, and you'll start to build that community back for yourself. Absolutely, there's always a way to be respectful in giving your critique and acknowledging that the person is learning and the reason they're asking for it is because they want to get better, so um, being gracious, for sure. Uh, my final question just for the panel was, since we're seeing a lot of, a lot of the artwork across industries kind of converge, not only in games and film, but also in like arc viz and digital fashion, how do you think this is gonna affect how people present themselves in their portfolio and what they show and what they, how they present themselves as creators and artists? Um, I guess we'll start with Tyler. Um, I would say, let me think about that for a second. <laughs> Yeah, what is really cool is that, yeah, real-time art, I think it, it is amazing how it's covering almost every medium now, from archivist to movie production, TV production, game production. Um, I would say, yeah, for the element of your, if you're going for film production pipeline, it's like, well, okay, um, topology, poly count, like as long as it, I mean, even with Nanite, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing how fast this technology is changing and um, how, you know, um, optimization that used to be so essential for like a game art uh, production piece um, is kind of something that is changing right now, which is crazy to think about because that used to be, you know, like 50% of when I was making something. It's just like, okay, what's the poly count on this? You know, how many draw calls are on this? Um, what's the texture size and everything? So I would say with that, um, focusing on just making a very, very strong uh, piece of art, as cliche as that sounds, and then just knowing just taking away the smoke and mirrors of just, okay, I know the basics of game production, uh, the basics of laying out, you know, uh, the UV work, um, the material IDs work, the topology. Um, if it's for film production, obviously it can be higher. Um, if you're going for 
Uh, if you're wanting to reach out for a mobile studio, you still have to kind of think back a little bit of just like, okay, this needs to be a pretty light poly count. This needs to be a texture resolution that's, you know, 1024 or something like that. So keeping that in mind. But what unifies it all, I think, is that it's all, it can all be an Unreal, it can all be real-time work. Um, it's no, it's getting less and less where it's like, okay, this is gonna be an Arnold render, this is gonna be, you know, a render man render. Uh, you just throw it into UE5, put some lights on it, get Lumen going, and you essentially have, you know, this really beautiful piece that you can rotate, interact with. Um, and that's what I think is really exciting about going forward with this. Yeah, I was just going to say to that effect, um, really learning how to work with your assets in your creation so that you can say what its limitations are and what its um, strengths are. You want to be able to create something nowadays where you can go put it on a switch and then also run it through Final Pixel for us, you know, for production purposes. Being able to actually structure your portfolio that way and talk about how you can do that with something is going to make you very valuable because now you're only building one asset that goes across multiple cross medias versus actually having to build a huge team that is now having to deprecate and change and adjust as you go. Yeah, I mean, and I've been working in games since PlayStation 1. I'm old. So the one thing I've noticed is that the development process doesn't really change so much. You're still doing the core concepts. It's just technology comes and goes. But when you're making something like uh, what you were saying about the real-time content, yeah, it's like you know, AR and VR uh, and mobile kind of share the same thing where you have to make sure you're being friendly with your with your actually polygon budgets. But just in general, just because you can add more resolution to something for games or for t TV doesn't mean you need to. You can take something, I can make an asset and literally have it be in ArcViz or product development or inside of game dev and visual effects virtual production. It looks the exact same, and I, it's really the application that's being choose to, like the studio is like, hey, we're going to do ArcViz with this. Cool. I can probably take the exact same content and put it into a game engine and, and use it for a game level. So it really comes down to, as always, identifying the style and making sure that you have a clear subject matter because there's so much out there. Uh, I don't want to say competition-wise. There's so many people trying to get jobs right now. But you have to kind of take the risk of making you be like a little bit of a point as opposed to rounding out, well, I can do everything. It's not that you can't do everything. It's like own one specific space, and that will translate to all these different industries, have that style. Because nowadays, even ArcViz and other studios really are looking for something to shake up their own space as well. They might look at your work and be like, oh, wow, that could be great for like showcasing this new building we're trying to do. So you know what I mean? Tyler's art is so cool. It's <laughs> just like... <laughs> captivated every single time. Um, so I, I think like one of the things, Sierra, like with your question, like convergence, I think that's really kind of cool is that, yeah, there is this convergence, right? We're having all these different industries come together because of real time. And, uh, you know, I can only, I can speak to, you know, my experience here at Epic where it's like, you know, we work on these different projects that are cross disciplinary and that we get people that works in, work in film and people that have worked in games together. And I think it's really cool because we're able to sort of learn from each other, right? So I would just say that, like, I, I don't feel like you need to have, like, this overly comprehensive look at, like, oh, I need to understand what's happening in automotive and also ArchViz and also in games and also in film, right? Like, yeah, you can be that generalist person for sure. But, like, if you drill down and just focus on one of those disciplines, I can say definitively that, like, any of those companies would be happy to have those different, like, disciplines, right? Because, like, if you think about it, like automotive people, right, that make really amazing renders in the automotive space, they probably don't have a ton of people that have migrated over from the games industry, as an example. And there's so many different pieces that become interactive with some of the things that are happening in that space. So I don't know, all that to say that I think that, yeah, you can, you can definitely still drill down and be an incredibly valuable asset to whatever industry it is that you're looking to be in. One thing uh, I was going to add, too, is uh, if you cast a very wide net of different uh, styles and mediums and stuff, just know... Um, you're going to be doing that eight or more hours a day, five days a week for years and years potentially. So um, definitely make sure that um, everything that you put on there, don't, don't just put on there where it's just like, hey, I want to get hired. Like I'll just cover all these bases or I'll you know, cast this wide net and hopefully get in there because you might get picked for the thing where it's like, well, I'll put it in there because I want to get hired, not exactly because I like doing that subject matter. And then before you know it, you have, you know, 10 years of making, you know, <laughs> working on an art form or a subject matter where you're kind of like, yeah, but it's not really my passion. So that is one thing to keep in mind. Um, and in a realistic sense, it's like, hey, livelihood, you know, paying rent and everything like that. But it, it is a big thing to keep in mind. It's just like, you know, hey, you are getting signed up when you do get hired of, you know, you're going to be spending lots and lots of time working on this stuff. So just make sure it's a thing that you really love.
Yeah, and to go back to the collaborative process, um, a lot of you guys have seen our fellowship program and the work that comes out of there. A lot of the people work with each other to find their strengths and their weaknesses to build up each other. For instance, I like lighting, look to have materials. Don't ask me to animate, it's not gonna happen. But then there's somebody else who's an animator, we've collaborated, helped, I gave them advice on theirs and them on mine. This you see happen all throughout all those projects. These aren't people that are just masters of uh, Unreal in five weeks. They reached out, they have a community, and, that's, and work towards their strengths. Absolutely, I think if there's anything we see on our station is that the demand for real-time skills is, is coming up not just in games, but kind of across all these industries. So it's important to look at like where your skills might be transferable because there's so many opportunities you might be overlooking.